Um, I'm Arlene, by the way. This is Rebecca, Stacy, and Matea. And like was mentioned, we all teach in the Department of Nutrition, Dietetics, and Food Sciences here on the Logan campus. And we all have offices in the basement. But uh, so if you're ever over there for Aggie ice cream, you can stop and say hi. Uh, we're also um, all registered dietitians. So we like vegetables, but we enjoy chocolate too. And um, what else? Oh, we, we're all moms. Between the four of us, we have 12 kids. <laughs> I know, I added that up today. I thought, oh, that's, that's pretty good. So that includes Stacy's baby that's coming in October. And uh, it also includes three girls that have joined Rebecca's family in the last six months. And two stepkids or bonus kids that came with my husband. So they're all still pretty little. Me and Matea and Stacy all had baby girls um, in the 2016-2017 school year within a nine month period. So they're all under the age of two. And that was fun, especially for our department head who got to figure out how to rearrange teaching schedules to accommodate that. But anyway, the, the last thing I'll mention that we have in common is that we all teach at least one uh, blended style course. And uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about what that looks like in practice for the four of us because it's all a little bit different from person to person. But uh, the, the purpose of this presentation is to, to first kind of introduce blended learning and that format and what, what it looks like and how, how it's defined. And then the majority of our presentation will focus on how to evaluate a blended course. Because what we've discovered in this process is that um, it, it's kind of tricky. It's not quite as straightforward as evaluating a quote unquote traditional course. And so we'll share some uh, some of the challenges and questions that we encountered and, and things that we've discovered and learned along the way and um, hopefully be able to share some tools and ideas with you. Yeah? Are you focused on evaluating students or evaluating the content on the campus? Uh, kind of both. Okay. Yeah, and we're, we're going to get there because in a blended course there's multiple things that you have to evaluate. So the, the script for our presentation is all written out actually, like our presenter this morning talked about. And so we recently published this article in the Journal of Empowering Teaching on Teaching Excellence. And um, so the link is there and those slides will be available afterwards. And uh, you're welcome to, to download that and get some more details about the things we talk about today. Uh, before I start, I just kind of want to get a pulse about um, what you already know about a blended format versus a traditional format. When I say blended, what, what comes to mind? Online, yeah. So there's a com an online component, usually. Any other thoughts? OK, let's see how it's defined in the literature in, in most cases. Um, when we say traditional learning format, uh, it kind of looks like this, where there's uh, an instructor-led lecture or uh, a classroom component. And uh, sometimes people call this the sage on the stage, where uh, it's, it's mostly passive learning and people are there in a the classroom and, and listening. With a, a blended learning model, it, it takes a traditional classroom experience and blends it with an online experience. And the, the goal is to accentuate the, the strengths or the positives of both styles of, of teaching and learning. And so there's usually a synchronous component and an asynchronous component. And so synchronous means that it occurs in real time and it's often in a classroom setting and there's live interaction. And then uh, asynchronous means that it's, it can be in an online environment. And students and the instructor don't necessarily have to be on at the same time or interacting face to face. Sometimes you'll hear blended re learning, learning referred to as hybrid or flexible learning. And uh, f 
a flipped model or flipped learning is considered a, a type of blended learning as well. So one of the reasons that the four of us have converted to a, a blended format is because a lot of the research is pretty compelling about um, uh, what can potentially happen when you change that format. And so, for example, the, the U.S. Department of Education published uh, some, some research back in 2010, and, uh, and they said that if there's an online component or an asynchronous component in a classroom, then students often demonstrate improved in-class engagement and attendance and overall academic achievement. Other literature has also said that a combination of different learning formats can offer the advantages of each type and free up more time for student-centered learning and discussions in a classroom setting. And so and that's kind of the goal of, of a blended format or converting to that. Uh, flipped learning, sometimes known as inverted learning, kind of... Uh, has that same idea in mind where students complete some pre-course work uh, on their own time. They come to class more prepared because they've actually engaged with content. And then you can use that class time for the application piece or the, the homework piece and, um, and make that uh, class time more student-centered instead of an instructor focused. So uh, at USU, they defined a blended course as where there's where participation is between 21% and 79% online or asynchronous and the remaining part is in a synchronous setting which includes IVC. So it's a pretty uh, generous definition. And then you can also convert to a, a blended format by, by filling out a blended course request form and then people from City can help you make that transition. So the four of us have done that and here's an example of what that uh, looks like for us. So Stacy teaches a food literacy class um, and she's scheduled to teach that at 7.30 in the morning. And uh, historically, she didn't always get 100% attendance. Imagine that. So, <laughs> so uh, her class also includes a weekly lab where students come to a kitchen and they prepare food and uh, learn as well. So Stacy converted most of her in-class lectures, or recorded most of them, made them available on Canvas. Students now have the responsibility to listen to those lectures before they come to the weekly in-class lab. And so there's that synchronous and asynchronous component. Uh, with Matea, she teaches a maternal and child nutrition course. And same concept where she has recorded lectures online on Canvas. Students are expected to preview those and work uh, through the learning objectives before they come to class. And then the class time is reserved uh, mostly for guest lecturers who are uh, professionals in that field. Uh, I teach a large enrollment general education course. And, um, and so in order to make that work, what, what we've done is we've um, gone to a meeting once a week in class on Tuesdays and then that remaining time is filled with additional online content and self-paced modules and assignments that students can uh, do outside of class. Rebecca has a, a flipped model where she assigns pre-class work online and then in the classroom then they uh, do homework and uh, uh, activities and uh, application of that material. So what we've discovered, though, is that many instructors have limited uh, instruction or direction when it comes to evaluating a blended course because blended is still kind of new, and so evaluating it is still uh, kind of new as well. But the thing is, you've, you've got to be able to evaluate multiple components of this, and so you need feedback from students and from faculty, but also from instructional designers to help you see if you're really meeting your course objectives and if you're um, meeting students' needs as well. So uh, the good thing is that there's various uh, learning resources and tools and methods that can be 
used, and so that's what we're going to focus on for the, the rest of our presentation. So I'll turn it over to Rebecca, and she can do her part. All right, so when we talk about evaluating our teaching, I think the first thing that comes to mind in general is our idea evaluations, right? Last few weeks of class, the students get this sent out. Um, and these are actually mine, and I love the pattern that has emerged in mine. You can tell every time I innovate in my class. Every time I flip it, change it, do something completely new, those scores drop while I figure it out. And then I climb up again, and then I get in that mood of, ooh, maybe I should do something new. Um, and so we wanted to talk about those, because I don't really change that much as a teacher or a person. But as the content changes and changes shape, you're going to get different patterns that emerge. And what do you do when your department head is like, my goodness, what happened to you in spring of 2015? Which happens to be the very time I flipped my course for the first time. So expect a learning curve. That's what I would say about flipping your class. Um, so student evaluations in teaching do have an appropriate use. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that. But I want to talk about some of the limitations of student evaluations first. And I'm going to be a little anecdotal here to begin with. Um, I have a brother who teaches at the University of Central Arkansas. And he's taught there for almost 10 years now. And he's a well-respected teacher. He's this kind of big, gregarious guy. We only make big people in my family. Um, but he's really student friendly. He has a couple mentorship awards. Like students just really like him. And he gets out of control, really high student evaluations of his teaching. Now, a few years ago, I think three, his wife hired on to the university to teach the exact same course that he teaches. And his wife, she's a lovely person, but she's a little bit more, well, less personable. Um, she's quieter. She doesn't make those direct contacts with the students like my brother does, but she is a methodical, thoughtful teacher. In fact, my brother said of his wife, I never really knew what good teaching was until I started watching Vita. Um, she's a really good teacher. She does all the things we're told to think about, all the pedagogy. Well, her teaching evaluations have never come anywhere near my brother's. And so he started to look into this, and one of the things that both he and she were thinking about was the fact that students aren't actually experts in our course. They don't actually know what your course is supposed to look like. They've never had that course before. And so it is a primary limitation of evaluations that we are asking a non-expert to give us feedback on something that requires expertise. So as you're looking at your evaluations, we have to keep that in mind to a little bit. Now I've put some other things that are of concern with them. Number one is gender bias. Lots of good research out there that shows women just get lower teaching evaluations than men. Um, the expectations that students have for women are quite different. Again, and I'm sorry to be so full of nepotism today, but my brother studied this and looked at it. And one of the things that really happens is that men are expected to be experts, whereas women are expected to make mistakes. So they have two teachers that they looked at um, one, they could track student kind of, I'm sorry, I'm not talking very well, um, but student rapport over time. They went in every week. And as soon as the female teacher made a mistake, her ratings would drop in half. Whereas the man could make a mistake on the board up to 15 times before the student ratings would drop. Um, so being aware of that is something you have to think about. Likeability bias, we know that's going to be there. If your students like you, they're going to give you higher ratings. Um, and then I want to point out that there is somewhat a poor correlation to learning in our student evaluations. Students are largely just telling you whether or not they liked the class. They don't actually know what they were supposed to learn. And so whether or not they learned what you wanted to may or may not correlate with what it is that you um, or how they perceived you as a teacher. So blended courses often get lower evaluations. And you have to think about that a little bit especially when you're going to go, and I was naive, I'm a new teacher and I tend to kind of just fly at things when I get excited, um, but you might want to warn your department head, warn people that you're going to be doing this because they probably will drop. And some of that seems to come from our expectations of teachers. I am doing right now exactly what you expect a teacher to do. I am standing up here sounding confident and hopefully being somewhat entertaining. And you probably are like, oh, yeah, this is working for me. On the other hand, when I flip my course and I spend most of my time observing my students, maybe occasionally interacting with them one-on-one, -on -one, giving them some feedback, but I'm kind of letting them flounder, 
they do get frustrated. They tend to be like, what is she even doing? Now, a lot of work went into what I'm doing and how I'm observing my students and the activities that they're doing. And I'm watching them build a skill set little by little and I'm monitoring and adjusting that when it goes wrong. But it's not this that you're used to looking for. So what do we do when we're using those student evaluations of teaching? Well, I think it's important to remember their place. Um, they are highly effective, and I'm a wanderer, and then I forget what I wrote, um, to evaluate your rapport with students. We do need to know that we're being human with our students, that they have a certain amount of likability, because reciprocity in education exists. So you listen to me because you think I'm worth listening to. And if we don't have rapport, if I'm not a good person at building rapport with others, those students are probably not going to learn as effectively from me than they will from another person. Um, we also want to make sure that I can communicate effectively with my students, that they understood what the course was about, they understood who I was, um, that I understood who they were, so those kinds of things. And also your end of semester evaluations are really helpful to help you look at something maybe you changed mid-semester. So if you knew something was going wrong, you initiated a change, they give you a really good outcome to look at. Now, unfortunately, what they shouldn't necessarily be used for is to make content and pedagogy decisions. Uh, those need to belong to experts, and again, students are not experts in your teaching. And also, your evaluations probably shouldn't be used as the primary indicator of a teacher's value. Um, it's nice if you get really high ones, you wander around patting yourself on the back, but as my brother has anecdotally proven, it doesn't necessarily mean you are the better teacher. It means that you're probably really good at getting students to like you, and you're relatively good at communicating your expectations to them in a way that they understand. So keep those in perspective as we talk about other pieces that need to be involved in evaluating your course. Okay, so like Rebecca mentioned, um, Student evaluations is really just one piece of the puzzle when it comes to evaluating blended courses and peer evaluations provides additional perspective that you can get from your peers. Um, the big part about peer evaluations is that sometimes we don't want to schedule them, they're time consuming, they're daunting. I know the first few years I was teaching, I would procrastinate until about the end of the semester. I would finally set it up. I would choose a lecture that I knew I was the most passionate about, the most knowledgeable on. I'd prepare way more for that lecture than most of my other ones so that I could get a really good evaluation. I usually got a fairly positive evaluation with very minor feedback. But the result was that I got a pretty meaningless uh, peer evaluation, right? It didn't help me with professional growth and it really didn't help me with my course improvement. Um, and peer evaluations do have the potential to be very meaningful if we put effort into them and we plan ahead. So when you are planning to do a peer evaluation, there's really three things that we need to focus on with our peer evaluations. And that is thinking about the type and the purpose of peer evaluation that you're choosing. If you are specifically evaluating a blended course, then you want to make sure that you're choosing a peer evaluator that has experience, knowledge, um, training in a blended class so that they can give you good feedback on that. And then you also want to be very careful about the rubric that you're choosing as your form for that peer evaluation. So I'm going to spend time talking about the first and last point because the second one's pretty self-explanatory, choosing someone that has some experience with that. Um, there's really two types of peer evaluations. There's summative and formative. So summative is what I think is more of the traditional type of peer evaluations. That's what I did in the past and this is where you basically set up that peer evaluation. They might review your rubric for you. They come and observe you on one class period and then either fill out a rubric or write you a letter and that goes in your promotion, tenure, documentation. Um, and really there's a lot of limitations to that because a lot of times feedback isn't communicated very well. A lot of times the information that you're getting from them isn't really applicable or it doesn't really target what you're wanting for your professional growth or um, doesn't give you feedback on what you're concerned about in your class. Um, and again, it's likely biased and not representative because they're observing one class period, much like my experience those first few years, and they're not getting a good picture of your overall teaching. Uh, the second type of peer evaluations are called formative. And the structure of these are that you schedule a pre-evaluation meeting. And in these pre-evaluation meetings, you're going to discuss 
really your areas of concern. So if maybe you got a low score on student evaluations or maybe in your own personal evaluation of your teaching, you have some areas that you just feel like you're weak in, that you could bring those up in that pre-observation meeting and say, these are really areas that I'm concerned about. Could you watch for these and give me your opinion on them? Or maybe you're taking on a new teaching approach such as transitioning to blended or maybe you added a new module or a new assignment or activity and you could ask them to really look into that and give you feedback on problems they might foresee with it or how you might be able to improve it. And then with the actual observation, you could have them observe all parts of your class or you could just target a specific thing. So sometimes I just have them look at a new module that I made or you could have them look at the online portion or your face-to-face -face portion, etc. And then you have a post-observation meeting or a follow-up meeting. And this is really important and this is where the advantage comes with the formative evaluations in that you have a meaningful discussion. So when people fill out a rubric or write you a letter, a lot of times that goes into your documentation and then it stays there and you kind of forget about it. You don't really talk about the things that they saw that you could work on. But if you have this post or follow-up observation meeting, this is where you could really just say, you know, what were things that you saw? You already told them things you were concerned with and they could give you their opinion on ways that you could improve and hopefully you would have a meaningful discussion. And then you can either add this to your promotion and, and tenure documentation, show improvements in teaching, or you could just use that for your own professional growth and course improvement. Um, so then, of course, you, you schedule these meetings, you pick the right person to evaluate your course, and then the last part is picking the right type of rubric. So when I transitioned to a blended course, uh, a big concern of mine was, is this blended course at least equivalent, if not superior, to the traditional format in facilitating student learning. Are they getting the same content? Are they still learning the things that I want them to? And when I first started, I, I didn't really have much luck finding rubrics specific to blended courses. And I would try to like update or modify ones I found online or from colleagues, but they still didn't grasp all the different concepts. And so when Matea, a couple years after I started to, she got a blended class and we started discussing, you know, how do you evaluate effectively blended courses? And that discussion led to us looking into the literature and kind of getting to this point. But um, one thing that I really found is when you are evaluating a blended course and you're having peers evaluate it, you really want to keep these things in mind. You want to think about it should evaluate the online component, the traditional component of face-to-face, -face, as well as the course design, and then how well those blend together to uh, meet your course objectives. It's very, very difficult to find a rubric that incorporates all those things. So a lot of times what you're gonna have to do is utilize ones that are specifically targeted for online classes, and then find one that's specifically targeted for um, traditional classes and kind of use those together. Um, as far as good resources for evaluating online classes, these first two resources um, are really great. And actually, I'm, mine is a little bit different than I remember on here. But anyway, so Matea is going to talk about this, the resources from CD, so I'll let her talk about that. Um, there's also one more that I think didn't get on here, but there's a great article, and it's, uh, I think I refer to it in our paper, so you can look for that. But it lists 28 different peer-reviewed um, or 28 different evaluation tools for online learning. And um, they go through and compare it to Gamson and Chicory uh, seven principles of good practice in undergraduate education, which has been highly researched. And they link them to what percentage they meet those principles. And so those are really great resources. And then this last one, Blood and Learning Toolkit, they have, and it's really the only one that I've seen that has a peer evaluation form for a blended learning class. So it does incorporate both the online component as well as the traditional format. And so this is a really great re uh, website, this blending learning, blended learning toolkit. Um, there's a lot of research on there and a lot of guidelines to developing blended classes. So I'll turn it over to Matea so she can talk about resources with instructional design. Okay, I really like this section because I think it's kind of what makes blended courses and evaluating blended courses unique. Well, I'm specifically talking about the instructional design component and I think we're really in the, the right place for this discussion because we've had City who have put this 
conference together for us and so hopefully you've met a lot of the instructional designers as you've been here. But when it comes to blended course in, courses, instructional design is key. And that's something that we really don't have to consider as much when we're in a traditional face-to-face -face setting. And I'm referring to kind of that course development process, your canvas, your layout, your design, the technologies that you use, whether that's Panopto or, or videos, whatever it may be. So these really are essential. And it's essential that they are developed and, and laid out in a way that so students can be successful. But oftentimes, these are missed with our more traditional types of evaluations from peers and from students. And so we really do want to get those instructional designers involved to help ensure that the online component, the online environment in our blended course is really meeting the needs of our students and aligning with our objectives. So if you've not worked with an instructional designer before, I would highly encourage that you do because uh, I think they can make your job a lot easier and they can provide you a lot of resources that you may not know of. A few things that they do, and these are just a few, is helping align course objectives with assessments and activities, all of which, uh, this, you know, all of these tie right into our, our evaluation. Um, but aligning the online course content with in-class instruction, making sure that what you're talking about in class is supportive of the content that you're talking about online. Students want to see that connection and they want to see that integration. So that's key and they'll help with that. Providing assistance and feedback with Canvas layout and design. This is something that I continue to learn so much about and instructional designers have been really key in helping me ensure that my course is kind of set up in the easy layout so students know how to get from A to B and B to C. And then things like assessment rubrics and accessible materials. They have a lot of great resources for us that oftentimes faculty are not aware of. I'm going to show you the evaluation for the course quality rubric in just a minute, but this is a great tool that we can use that we can have ask instructional designers through City to evaluate the blended part, our online portion of our course, so we can get that feedback from the expert in the field. Instead of asking a faculty member who may not teach blended courses or getting that feedback from a student who doesn't know really what an effective blended course is supposed to be like. So I'll show you what that looks like. Also, they have an online peer review of blended courses where you can request that a peer somewhere in the university reviews your course. If you have a spe specific person in mind, you can include that information or else you, they will just select someone for you with the blended course experience. I talked with Amy Carpenter as I was putting these slides together. She's one of the instructional designers at City, and I asked her, what do you want people to know? And she, a couple of the things that she pointed out, she wants people to know that they are available for one-on-one -on -one meetings with the, any of the instructional designers and that they're happy to help you with any part of the process, whether you're transitioning from a traditional face-to-face -face course to a blended course or just kind of redesigning. She also wanted me to point out that the feedback that you get through these evaluation tools available through City can be as formal or informal as you like. If you're wanting to use it just to help improve your course, that's uh, perfectly fine. That's what this content is for. If you want to use it to help support your teaching documentation, you can use it for that. But they don't actually share any of these evaluations with your department head, your dean, or any other administrators. So that's kind of on you as to however you want to use this information. I think most importantly, it's, it's important to recognize that they're not only here to provide these evaluations and help facilitate the evaluations, but they're here to help you figure out how you can improve as a result of that data that you've been given. And uh, that's really one of the key concepts of evaluation. If we don't make changes as a result, that data is, is pretty worthless. So. Here's their website if you haven't been there. And uh, up in the upper left hand corner, they're the faculty resources, the online course quality rubric is listed, and then the course peer review request form. It's, you're not going to be able to see it from where most of you are sitting, but this is the form that City will fill out if you ask an instructional designer to evaluate your blended course. They focus on things like course organization and appearance, policies and procedures, how things are orientated, the, the learning design, the layout, and then accessibility. So that's really what their focus is going to be, and it's going to be on that online component. If you want a peer review, <coughs> 
It's a very quick and easy form. It takes about three weeks, Amy said, for them to be able to you know, get your information, ask someone to review, uh, do a peer review, and then for you to get that back. And so I do think that's quite speedy. It's a great opportunity if you want someone outside of your department or discipline to review your course, or if you don't know of someone personally that uh, teaches a blended course. Just to wrap up, I just wanted to kind of point out that we do highly encourage, based on our research within this area, that with blended courses, you not only <coughs> rely on that student feedback, but also peer and instructional designers. <coughs> Excuse me. Of course, I got a cold right before. <coughs> Thanks. And <coughs> consider evaluating at different time points. So, Oftentimes we, try, we rely on those idea evaluations at the end of the course, and that's something we want to stray away from. But really my most important bullet that I think I could talk about is what you use that data for. So making sure that <clears throat> if you're like me and it takes you a week or so to actually look at those idea results, that's fine. But do make sure that whether it's from peers, instructional designers, or students, you do take that feedback, you apply it to your course, and then you reevaluate. Our data really means very little if we don't do anything with it. <clears throat>